My father was a snowman, was a snowman, but he melted. My father was a snowman, but he melted, but he melted. All that's left are his eyes, two pieces of coal that sit on my kitchen table and watch me as I walk around the room. Two pieces of coal that sit on my kitchen table and watch me as I walk around the room. My father was a snowman, but he melted, but he melted, but he melted. I ate his nose a long time ago. I ate his nose. A long time ago, a long time ago. <laughs> Big, strong, brown, soft. My dad's pre-spoon-sized shredded wheat in my bowl. I'll wait. I'll let no one but daddy crush my two big pieces of shredded wheat with his bare hands. Mommy said she can do it. I'll wait. My brother scolded me, girl, do it yourself with your spoon. I'll wait. Daddy comes downstairs in a hurry. Daddy, will you? doing it. I'm smiling. He's making that sound like it's really hard to do. I'm laughing. He kisses me on my forehead. I sprinkle sugar over my shredded wheat and pour some milk, each spoonful, like always, tastes like Vitalis. Daddy combs his hair right before he comes downstairs in a hurry and crushes my shredded wheat. I don't mind. During the summers when I was in college, Christmas and spring breaks too, I waitressed in a diner on 35. I worked the graveyard shift, serving the after movie crowd, the bar rush and breakfast to those who woke for work before dawn. I ate anything I wanted as much as I could. The Greeks were good to me. My father was a mason. He came home from work filthy with flecks of dirt and dust and concrete, and he never entered my mother's clean house until he'd washed and changed himself first, down in the damp and cool below the earth in the cellar, the foundation of our house. Once when I was alone there running water to wash my hair for work, my father came home and I was in his way. I didn't look at his face. I didn't smell his exhaustion, hunger, pain. I was unaware, bent over the water, my hair spilling like serpents into the sink. He yelled, why don't you respect me? 
I straightened myself, looked away from his eyes, down at his filthy hands and pants. I looked away from his dark eyes, staring into my own, into my heart, my heart that learned at college that doctors and lawyers are better than bricklayers, my heart that let my rich school friends buy me dinner. My heart had turned cheap. I stood before him, motionless and mute, cold water dropping from my hair like stones. And I waited for him to hit me, watched him raise his hand, then twist it under my eyes for me to see his yellow calluses, his cracked and blackened nails, his bruised and bloody knuckles, the stigma of his work. Why don't you respect me, he said. My hands bleed to feed my children. He was lost to the sensitive world the moment they brought him home from the hospital. Mother, dead, giving him birth. Six brothers waiting to hate the little murderer. The father, confused, in pain, and filled with resentment, crippled by his own loss. Never any celebration of his arrival into this world. The painful remembrance of her passing too much to bear not even a birthday card. By nine, school was no longer an option, odd jobs and panhandling a way of life. At 13 and four foot five inches, he sat on a milk crate and drove a delivery truck operating the brakes with a stick. A corner cot at home to sleep on, no gifts at Christmas. His clothes hand-me-downs to the runt of the litter. Street fights, day and night, making his way in the world. A family jockeying for power within itself. A house of men trying to outbutch themselves. No soft touches. No caresses on a feverish forehead. Off to foreign lands of war at 16 and killing Germans became a task. The boy, a man, grown now, and childhood remained a bad memory of survival. Married by 21, having sons of his own, trying to find his way around new territory of love and caring. Be a man, he told us boys at 13. Watch your back. Trust no one. Good advice for paranoids and little soldiers looking for wars of their own. I found mine in him. I hated his butchness, his rough hands, his bad manners. This Miss Thing wanted luxuries like silk and satin, all things soft and refined. We didn't speak for several years. He didn't hit me with his hands, but his words taught me how to fight. I once saw my little father at five foot two knock out a man six foot four with one punch. The man didn't get up, at least not right away. I never knew some things about my father until I grew up and moved away. And now when I see him, he kisses me and holds me, and I him. And I want to be the happy childhood he never had. And I want to love him in all his butch glory, in all his male malevolent beauty, to hand him back all those missed years of mothering, to let him know the meaning of caring, to put these gay arms around those broad butch shoulders and to set him free upon the river of forgiveness, to celebrate his arrival and to thank him for mine. The night John Candy died, three friends of mine called and asked, did you hear John Candy died? I heard, I said to friend number one, between bites of a pizza. I heard, I said to friend number two, wiping ice cream from my lips. I heard, I said to friend number three, drowning two liters of Pepsi. The night John Candy died, I started my 63rd diet of the year, March 4th, 1994. The night I took my father to a movie about Charlie Parker, he peed his pants, came out of the lobby bathroom, Memories dripping down his leg, stood there, unaware, numb and drunk, happy we had finally shared something, something about Charlie Parker. The night I took my father to a movie about Charlie Parker, 
I told him for the first time I wanted to be a comedian, just like John Candy. Is it true what they say about the preacher's daughter? You know what they say. You know what they say about a preacher's daughter. You know what they say. It's only a matter of time. She's a time bomb. It's only a matter of time before she blows. She's a wild girl. You know, they're the rowdiest ones. You know, they rage the hardest. I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time before she blows. You know what I heard about the preacher's daughter? She's still a virgin. Can you believe? At her age, are you a virgin? Are you a good girl? Are you a sweet girl? Did you get straight A's? Are you daddy's girl? Are you the teacher's girl? Are you a party girl? Are you a nasty girl? Are you a go-go girl? Aren't you a big girl? Aren't you a bitchy girl? Aren't you a bit old for that? Aren't you the girl next door? Are you studying again? Are you smoking again? You know what I heard. She gave this guy a blowjob on her first night of college. My roommate saw it right there in the window. She didn't even bother to pull the shades. She didn't even bother to pull the shades. They had the light on and everything. She just sucked him off right there in the dorms, and my roommate saw the whole thing. Yeah, well, I heard she likes it in the shower. She did it with that same guy in the dorm showers that same week, and everybody on the floor knew about it. And can you believe she didn't even care? And can you believe she's actually a preacher's daughter? But you know what they say. You know what they say about a preacher's daughter. You know what they say. It's only a matter of time. She's a time bomb. It's only a matter of time before she blows. She's a wild girl. You know, they're the rowdiest ones. You know, they rage the hardest. I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time before. So, is it true what they say about blows? Is it true what they say about girls with small hands? Is it true what they say about girls with big titties? Is it true what they say? You know, what you need is love. What you need is a good hot meal. What you need is a good hard fuck. What you need is another fucking degree. What you need is some Christ in your life. What you need is some real sin. What you need is a man. What you need is another hit. What you need is a slap in the face. What you need is something to believe in again. What you need is a weekend out of the city. What you need is a lord. What you need is a hundred sit-ups. What you need is a woman. What you need is another glass of wine. What you need is some honesty for a change. What you need is a better relationship with God. What you need is to shut up and listen. You never listen. You never listen. The wind is ours for the taking. The wind is not for the taking. The wind is ours for the taking. The wind is not for the taking. Take the wind in our arms and embrace who we are. Take the wind in our arms and embrace who we are. I am a streak. My plummet carries a seed, a seed with the wind in its arms. I tickle its bone. It lets the wind go. I pick up the wind. I am a streak with the wind in my arms. My plummet carries an ocean, changing, never changing. Bobby, Bobby, tell me how I'm going to grow. Tell me how I'm going to grow. Bobby, Bobby, tell me how I'm going to grow. Tell me how I'm gonna grow. Tell me how I'm gonna stand like you do. Oh, tell me how I'm gonna stretch like you do. Oh, tell me how I'm gonna be just like you. Oh, mommy, mommy, tell me how I'm gonna grow. Tell me how I'm gonna grow. Tell me how I'm gonna dream like you do all. Tell me how I'm gonna laugh like you do all. Tell me how I'm gonna be just like you all. Mommy, mommy, amigame, digame, sigame. Why don't you friend me? Why don't you tell me? 
Why don't you follow me? As a girl, my mother always fetched the fruit from the mango grove behind closed bamboo and ripped its paper leather cover during midday recess before English class. My mother describes their dance, peaches, plums, and cantaloupes before my first world eyes. When the sun blazed on the dust, she let the fluids fall on her assignment books. Where the mangoes were first planted, my mother, an infant, hid under gravel, swaddled by Lola, my grandmother, after my mother's aunt and uncle were tied to the trunk of the first tender mango tree and stabbed by the Japanese. My mother and Lola, living off of fallen mangoes, the pits planted in darkness for many years until I was born. We, a family of five, left the Philippines for California, dodging U.S. customs with the forbidden fruit, thinking, who deprived mother of her mangoes? Head down, my father denied that we had perishable foods and waved passports in the still air, motioning for us to proceed towards a terminal. My mother was behind, facing a long line of travelers, as my sisters surrounded her like soji screens. My mother hiding the warm mangoes, boiling between her legs, covered in newspapers. Her skirts, a brilliant batik billowing from the motion of airline caddies pushing suitcases on metal carts. We walked around mother like mini airplanes forming a crucifix where she was the center. On the plane as we passed time zones, mom unwrapped her ripe mangoes, the ones from the tree Lola had planted before she gave birth to my mother, the daughter that left home to be a nurse in the States who'd marry a Filipino Navy man and have three children of her own. My mother eating the fruit whose juices reigned over deserts and cornfields. Thank you. She gave me birth. She fed me food. She gave me birth. She fed me food. She taught me love. She showed me laughter. She urged me on. She fought my battles. She, she washed, washed my bottom. bottom. She, she scrubbed, scrubbed my feet. feet. She, she kissed my forehead. forehead. She, she cut, cut my meat. meat. She combed my hair. She wiped my tears. She calmed my fears. She took, she took the, the time. time. She went the extra mile. She always had a smile. She ran the house. She was the boss. She danced the Lindy. She, she blessed, blessed the children. children. She, she heard their, their vows. She, she shaped, shaped their, their visions. visions. She tucked them in. She walked them home. She woke them up. She showed them how. She told them why. She, she told, told them, them when. when. She, she told them where. where. She let them go. She made, she made them, them stop. Think. She gave, gave them hope. hope. She, she was, was a friend. friend. She showed them strength. She told them truth. She, she never lied. lied. She, she never lied. lied. She never lied. She never lied. She, she always cared. She, she took the time. She, she never lied. She never lied. She never lied. She gave me hope. I am not of this family. I know that now, and I am not of your skin. When I slit my wrists, I bled red. When you slit yours, you bled mud. You and your pills will search for me, search for my salvation, will question the beginning of when I first fell and offer explanations to explain me away. I count steps, 16, from closet to bed and breaths taken in a day. Cold numbers are warm comfort to me as you can no longer comfort your dark daughter. Stop accusing me, mother, I didn't choose this. No human hopes for a touch of mercury on the mind. Some people don't go crazy. Some of us were always there. While you were having breakfast, I was having visions, and I am slowly being rocked away from you. Me, this baby that still wails away with no cause, I am slowly being rocked away from you. Four years ago, in the middle of dinner, I interrupted and said, Pardon me, but I can feel pain in the ends of my hair. You put down your fork then, you put down your fork and fixed your attention on a girl grown wild when you weren't looking. Take away my hands, they weigh too much. This body is not me, it's just where I live for a while. 
I am more lucid when I give in and I disintegrate regularly. I feel the cells shift, listen to the bones slide. You hold me like a kite with a too long string. Once I hit sky, you'll let go. I've begun my descent into self, into soul. I've begun my descent and found everything's fine. I've begun my descent and can't get off the train. I've begun my descent and you cannot come with me. I look up to the shower head waiting for water. Cold shock hits hard and slams knife through bones and skin and soul and brain and what was me. Shudder and tremble and grasping the railing. Damn your therapies that leave me gasping, that turn me twice before I talk, leaving me with a long longing. Self-help therapy helps no one. Notebooks will not help me spew disease. Medication cannot get me out of my head. You cannot liberate me from this. I am this. With a delicious shove, I went over. And you are lucky, mother. You are lucky. I don't know the reason I am the way I am. So I wander around the house without a map saying, I am not this, I am not that, but I do not know what I am. The doctors define me by saying what my problem is not, but throw up their hands when faced with a brain beyond the radar, a gray lump more formidable than their garden of books. I ask angels for prayers to string into a necklace and wear around my neck. I lean against walls waiting for the day when I open up and I fall in. I am light with an awful lightness and drum my way through night. I'm not rid of this fungus. Well, the doctors will not cut it away. No surgeon will open my brain and let the madness leak out. If they drill my skull, the demons might escape, might take hold of their million-dollar hands, might hold on and bite down hard. Don't you wish I was an abortion mother? Don't you churn at night and wish you had the choice again? Don't you dream of laying a pillow on my face and throwing me out with a trash in the morning? I will rise up at midnight, will rise up and put on my wings to sweep over you, will rise up and hover over you in sky, in night. I will rise up and forgive you your trespasses. Use your hands and get me out of the straps. Sign the forms, Mom. Say you don't understand me, but you believe me. Release me from this white, white, white room, unlike heaven. The most the doctors hope for is to discover that my lunacy is new, is nameable with my last name, is discoverable for the medical books. I might be an award, I might be an article, I might be a nonprofit organization, I might be noble, but I'm a loss to everyone involved. If the bad side of you kills and takes over the good side of you, is it a little murder? Would anyone notice? Brain highways lead back to spine, back to the problem. I'm crawling out of a wrecked car, but no one really wants to see me get up and walk away. Trying to think takes up too much time. The neighbors say, we're so sorry to hear your daughter's brains are dripping out of her ears. My typewriter scurries in the middle of the floor like a rat, and the bed sheets rise up waves in a scary ocean. Moonbeams are crystal bars that nail me to the bed, and cobwebs vibrate into scary nets for when I fall. I am a 30-foot spire of unhuman girl stones standing on top of the shoulders of unclaimed ghosts. I am everything you fear you will become, mother. Crash through queen glass and say I was right all along. Rock this skeleton that has no use for blood or sense. Throw stones at me so I can build a crazy house. Stuff me with papers so I'm full of nothing and therefore new. I want to shave this head, get closer to the shrine, find out why this globe rules the rest of me so long. I want to touch the disease. I want to know where I've been hit. I have nothing to miss, no memories to wander over. I rub my arms over spackled walls and wait for them to tip over, become floor, become sky. This little little problem is mine. I'll give it a name. I'll give it somewhere to stay. I'll take care of it. I'll watch it grow up and take over. I'll take care of it now because I can. I guess that makes me my own little mother. Mother. Don't try to open up the door, mother. This poem is all mine. Finally, something is mine and makes sense. With a delicious shove, I go over and big words reach up. 
I swim over that wet line and keep swimming. I dig fingernails into stars and feel my feet lightly brush planets. Drummers thunder in my skull because there is no heartbeat to confuse them. The thumps rock me against chair. Color TV hums, pillow shreds, window releases. Cat opens mouth, spits out Bible. This is a hate house and everything I am, you're breathing. And now I'm happy and now you're terrified. And all of this is sleek and cut and fast and I am to go free. I am throwing up snow. I am spitting out keys. It's time to go. And all my words make me strong. Mother. I'm already gone. Thank you. Here I am, father suicide at two, mother still in place. Nothing changes. Life is a breath at a time. I used to, but now never. All your support has kept me afloat over the drowning man, says hello. Tomorrow the breakage will be evaluated by the adjudicators. How does everyone get paid for doing what they do, except me? I was a sun blazing trails in old Kentucky. Now, as a simple soul, I beg Buddha to replace my windshields. What is the poet on top of? Nothing. I send you love, Mom, what we know we should tell everyone. They call me white girl, all except the nuns, who call me dear, the way nuns should. Dear, Sister Thomas Rita invites me to the office. She wants to discuss some of her concerns. Concern for me, for which I want to weep, so glad and grateful for her concern. I'm not telling anyone because I have nobody to tell, but I'm pretty awfully concerned about me, too. No, dear, concerns. You know we're aware you're promiscuous. Dire shame, a nun no less. I was once in love with a girl who gave out leaflets about the Bible. It was tough. Dear, I know you recognize the covenant we make here. If you can't abide by your agreement, you can't stay. Sister Thomas Rita, you bat. She doesn't even offer me tea. Her office is at the top of the house, skylit, serene, and I'm out of my mind wanting to nap in her warm chair. I don't sleep well two floors down, even with my little white girl knife under my pillow, even after an hour and a half with some boy from a private school who does it three times and tells me I have to split before the cleaning lady gets there. People sometimes shit in the showers. I wash fast in the sink. Every day I go to school and wonder if it's worth it, go and eat as much school lunch as I can get, fall asleep in bio lab, get sent somewhere. The nurse will not have me anymore. In gym, I simply lay on the floor. Or I cut out with a boy, go sit on the backs of the stone turtles in the project playground, smoking pot and PCP. He pieces my name and his in a heart in the stairwell. We get up close and needy right there, paint acrid in our cold mouths. Caesar walks his dog up 10th Avenue to Hell's Kitchen to sit with me in Needle Park. The problem is I'm not Dominican. I'm not the mother of his baby. I understand. This is frequently the problem. I have to go back into the house now. It's almost 9. If you're not in by 9, you don't get back in. I need to get back in. Dinner is at 7, the one guaranteed meal. It's an okay place, as places go. Only 15 of us at a time, two nuns. My mother calls on the payphone and tells me her husband is gone. I can come home now. But still I hear him, breathing into the extension in my old room. Call the police. I love you. I dream of the banal of cooking eggs, the sweet cloy of fabric softener on clothing. We sit smoking menthols in front of the TV and braiding our hair. Someone's stepfather on the local news, cuffed, we cheer. White girl, you a flat-ass bitch. I learned to do the smurf, become a novelty. Still fucked with, though. Rondell is 12, but when she comes in, she says she's 17. I feel sick in my heart when I see her because I know now I'm going to be in love with her, too. 
She calls me mommy, not mommy like the PR girls, but mommy, mommy. Freshly, powerfully stacked, they keep her home out of school with the nuns all day, away from boys. I come in and she's piercing her nose with a thumbtack and a cube of ice. It's okay, mommy. I put it over a match first. She throws herself at me for hugs, hangs off my shoulders and hips. She pretends the pans and dishes are too heavy to lift in the sink. I do her chores, mine, some others. Now she doesn't want to suck her thumb even. She wants mine. I let her come into my bed at night with her dirty piece of sheet she carries and rubs. She murmurs and pedals her feet in her sleep, digs her ass into the spoon of me. Many serious covenants can be broken here. I'm alert against this all night. In the morning, she's cranky and threatens to stay in bed till found. I bribe her away with my stupid dull knife. Why is there a rule I can't just hold her while she sleeps? Blame the nuns. Dear mommy, white girl, I go looking for rooms by the month, SROs. Some hotels charge only by the hour. I have zero money. This girl at school tells me I need to get a bra. I don't know how many people know where I live or why I suddenly smell more. I feel like I've risen above it. Friday night, we get snuck into an early movie on the deuce and hang out in front of Orange Julius. Angel is from the boys' house, a scrawny teenage queen. He and I go off and get destroyed on airplane glue. Justice is blue, black, and fierce. All the boys want to do is fuck, no money, no place. On the roof of the boys' house is a pigeon coop, dead and starving pigeons. When we go home at 10, the nuns open the cabinet and hand out douches. Rondell is not allowed out past six, and she wants to run away. This guy, Freddy, has offered to take her with him to Florida, where they can make money. Angie comes up from Arkansas. Another white girl gets named Cracker. She's looking for a guy who said he was in the Marines here who got her pregnant. Freddy takes Angie instead. Take me. Girls come and go. Bernadette is insane for the Lord. Shaquille is a five percenter, hates the white man, takes serious offense at me. My new name is White Bitch. Things change. She doesn't like Rondell to put her head on my lap in the TV room. Perla comes in, weighing over 200 pounds, but Miss Perla doesn't take sides. My situation. Rondell pisses in my bed, probably on purpose, and I'm not her mommy anymore. I'm White Bitch now, which is new, but I roll with it. I don't know where or how she sleeps. I have a nice boyfriend now from school. His name is Scott, and he rides a skateboard. He wants me to come over after school while his dad is still at work. His dad is fucked up, too. He calls me on the payphone in the TV room and tells me we'll go away to Canada or to Mexico. He sleeps with a girl I was friends with. It's not you. It's me. Actually, I think it's her. I've lost faith in girls. Maxine is a stone butch who doesn't like me any better than the rest, but she lets me sit next to her at the table. She comes down to dinner with a pick in the back of her head. I like the way she rolls up one leg of her pants. Shaquille lectures on the wrath of Allah and Amon Ra. Maxine tells her to go sell a bean pie, and I make the mistake of laughing through my food. Me, Maxine, and Rondell in the TV room on a Friday night, the rest of the house out drinking Old E in front of Orange Julius. I wish I had an Old E or some acid or somebody who could fuck me for a while and talk about going away. The Hotel Mansfield Hall wants 300 bucks a month. I know. I try to get over this number many times every day. It's clear how much I need money. If I call my mother from the payphone, I'll hear her fourth husband's voice. There's a commercial on about cake. Mmm, you sweet talker. White people wearing clean clothes eating cake. It's just too much for me. I start to cry. Jane, homie. My new name. Maxine has her arms spread out against the back of the sofa, pick in the back of her head, one shin showing hairy. I know her older sister killed their father. Maxine visits her in Rikers. Now she curls her fingers to me, and I come into the side of her, under her arm. So then I'm feeling better, and I steal a wool beret from a sunglasses stand in Times Square, and I give it to Maxine, and she comes and sits with me in the kitchen at night, and while the rest watch TV, we read books. Maxine doesn't talk much or smoke cigarettes or look up ever, really, but she's solid in there. I don't know why. She's next to me, holding tight my hand. Thank you. Mom hated my body's infant grapple and thrust, even with me the only live child she ever had. Sternly blocked my clumsy reach for her milky breast, wouldn't teach me to call Maury, my father, dad. Susan was my same age, a second cousin but close. Grew up a driven lawyer, thin and smart as a whip. Once, showing dance steps, I locked her in an embrace. She gasped, 
froze, shuddered, and switched out of my grip. James, mom's eldest cousin, oldest brother of four, ruled seven, raised together by sisters who had run their men out of the house for whiskey, women, rages, and more, things they had no Irish Catholic words to contain. My parents lost their firstborn. Mom nearly died. They reviled and blamed Dr. Goldstein. Couldn't have handled it worse, a simple blood transfusion, all in bitter denial how such a thing couldn't happen if that pregnancy was the first. Maury came home once, found Mom locked herself in her car. James sidled out of the house, smirked like his father and stoned. Said he'd just come to visit his cousin close as they were. Maury went for James. Mom stopped him, made Maury leave James alone. At 47, Susan found a colon cancer had spread, scorned hopes of foreign cure, resigned, met her destiny with prayers for dead ants intervention, brutal palliatives that led through martyrdom's best torments, rolled like a bride onto death. Three generations of women made war with the men they knew. Whiskey, whores, mistresses, curses, and blows for their children, and worse. Mom went so far to the other extreme, she married a Jew. Susan never married, practiced law, all in divorce. Odd choices for Irish Catholic women who clung to their church, lived in the grace of saints and angels, visions of hell, lived in their terror of men in bodies they barely could wash. Three generations of stories not one woman could tell. And what besides this voice has it all left me? Not much, but to fear the look of fear the way mom feared occasions of sin. And whenever I reach for a woman, especially that first long touch, my hand jumps back an inch in the middle of moving in. Don't stick your finger in the electric socket, mother said. You could get a shock, and if it doesn't kill you, it'll leave a lot of static in your hair. It might not come out with shampoo. Your hair will stand straight on your head, and everyone will know what you did. If God didn't want you to have curly hair, he'd have given you to a different mother. But he gave you to me, and I wonder why. I went to temple. I said my prayers. <laughs> the further you venture from the house, mother said, the less people you'll know. Everyone on this block has either heard of you or has seen you at one time. But on the next block, maybe only one person will recognize you. Then there are hundreds of blocks where no one knows you exist. And it goes on that way until you get to Nebraska, <laughs> where it gets even worse. There, the people never met a Jew before. They think you have horns and will want to look for them. That's why you should never move too far away from me. You don't want strangers to always be touching your head. There's no proof that God is up there, Mother said. But no one can prove that he isn't. Only the dead know. But they're too busy being dead to tell us. So if I were you, I would go to temple and play it safe. If he's dead, all you lose is the time you spend praying. But if he exists and you didn't go, you'll be in big trouble. You won't like it in hell, 
you never liked hot weather. And then how can I visit you? Angels aren't allowed inside. You need children who will take care of you when you're old, mother said. Not that I expect you to take care of me when I get old. If you only learn how to take care of yourself and hold a steady job, I'll be happy. I don't expect you to support me when I'm old, though I should hope you'd want to pay me back in kindness for bringing you into this world. You don't have to give me all the kindness now. You can spread it out over the years. If it wasn't for me, you'd never have had a life, but would have been stuck inside your father's sperm cell with no way to get out. I never charged you for raising you, but maybe if I made you pay me every time I taught you some manners, you might have learned some. Thank you. of nails, everyone has a hammer. That a 50C common nail used to open outside door, father said. Try to open from the inside. Daughter pulled and pulled. No grip. Hand just slipped to point it in. Well, I nailed it shut. I nailed it shut, father said, reaching into carpenter bell. Ham full of nails, ham ready. Bam, bam, bam. Needs more nails. Pound, pound, pound. Daughter thought. My mind's not nailed up and turned to strut upstairs. Mother says, Mother says, not much. Father thought it was better to shut her up, so he pounded nails, connecting lips to close mouth up. Well, I nailed it shut. I nailed it shut, father said, reaching into carpenter bell, ham full of nails, ham ready, bam, 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 needs more nails, pound, pound, pound. Son tries bathroom door, he pulled and pulled, he had a pissing knee. But nail as knob here too Well, there wasn't anything that he could do Well, I nailed it shut I nailed it shut Father said, reaching into carpenter belt Ham full of nails, ham ready Bam, 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 needs more nails Son thought, oh, hammer of God, release me. Father said, bathroom will be out of use. I have no need to let it out. I used my hammer to figure it out. And he unzipped his fly and pulled it out. A nail hammered in his piss out spout. He dropped his pants to turn around to show his rear and out of his anus a bunch of nails stuck there. Well, I nailed it shut. I nailed it shut. Father said, pulling up pants, reaching into carpenter belt, handful of nails, hammer ready, bam, 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 needs more nails, pound, pound, pound. Son thought, mine frozen with fear. I thought you were 
was walking funny. You nailed a lunatic. Mother says, using also one hand, other hand clenched always round her hammer handle. Well, father, good man, a pounding way keep outside at bed. No way they break into strong home. Father said, if a storm comes, this house will roll and roll and roll. This house will not break. Ever board will stay in its place. What other house on the block can do that? We have a strong home. Daughter says, you nailed your mind shut. Now nothing can come in or go out. Son says, you nailed your mind shut. Now nothing. Mother says, lock lipped. We protected. Father and mother say, well, we nailed it shut. We nailed it shut. Reaching into carpenter belts, hands full of nails, hammers right up. Bam, bam, bam. Needs more nails. Pound, pound, pound. Son and daughter had no need to speak quietly as quickly they planned to make a break from this crazy path. Mother and father did loud, busy work. Sounds pounding away, any other sounds? Father says, needs more nails there. Mother says, no, need more there. Father says, no, no, honey, needs more nails there. Well, father and mother in disagree. Stop pounding so happily and pick up hammers instead to pound each other's heads angrily into the ground. Oh, hammers ready. Bam, bam, bam. Pound, pound, pound. Brother and sister look at their parents hammered in heads. Both parents now dead. Brother says to sister, we are released. Sister says to brother, we will build our new home right. Sister hands brother a hammer. Sister says, but we will be sure not to put nails in so tight that light cannot get in. Brother and sister picked up hammers to break their way out. We called a truce that Christmas, and I visited him in Bristol, one dark bag filled with fancy dresses and rhinestone bracelets for my nieces, hand-knit socks and fruitcake, two quarts each of rye whiskey and cream. We were good friends then. It was the only time in our lives. I made a huge bowl of eggnog, all of us in the long, narrow kitchen, separating eggs, wildly laughing, none of us able to keep our hands to ourselves. It was always that way with us. 
grabbing, slapping, howling. That year he painted my portrait, his studio an abandoned warehouse with patterned tin ceilings, a huge space with a warm center, the easel, the model's chair, green brocade worn down to the thick hemp veins underneath, the small table where he washed the brushes, made peanut butter sandwiches and boiled the water at tea time. Those were Brahms days, good Wagner days, listening to Tannhauser while he painted what he saw in my face. And there were rules, no makeup, hair in a stream over my shoulders. I tried some blush one morning but he sent me back to wash. Two flights down was the toilet, and there was always shame, him handing me the roll of paper, howling as I closed the studio door. Two flights down, and I could still hear the mad edge of his laugh, me having to pee so often, him finding me asleep once on the cot, nightgown at my hips, my butt stark naked in the moonlight. He threw his head back, howling, victorious, each time he repeated that story. Nobody laughed like he did. Mouth huge to his tonsils and the black tunnel of his throat. The vein just under his jawbone ballooned with pleasure like a cock awakened from sleep. His face, heart attack, red. I was always so willing to do our mother's bidding. I see us hovering around her. Why do you hate your sister? She'd ask him, or to me, it was the right thing to do, report back to her when he was smoking. Afternoons he'd be there waiting, finishing his tea and jellied toast. He wouldn't even let me take off my coat, throwing me down on the bed and daring me to try to get up. With the tips of his fingers between my breasts, he jabbed me and knock me down again. There were days I'd lie there, refuse to get up. The way I refused that morning, he forced me into mom's closet. Fat red banana curls, the length of my arm, cut to the bone at the base of my skull. But he threatened to punch me if I didn't get up. My big brother, huge in the doorway, all juiced up, me rocking up and down on the bed, fingers pressing my vagina, the cold rush of pee, and the dark stain of shame spreading through my uniform. Walk the walk of another man's shoes. Gather the blue of all the blues for Jabulani, which means happiness, Jabulani. I remember we were 10 brothers. I chased you with a stick, you chased me with a brick. I never thought of you as gay, but then we were teenagers. Hard on hand hump, hormone high on Motown, and you stopped in the name of love and dropped the big shoe. You think you got problems? I'm homosexual. I worried a year whether that disease would catch me too. I remember your brotherly visit to me in London, 72. From the airport you went to a bathhouse. Gone for three days like Christ off the cross. You old party hearty homo you. You could go to any city and start your vacation with an order of suck and pluck in out insemination with God knows how many beautiful strangers. The fabulous other. God damn, I should have been the gay brother. I remember we were walking in Johannesburg, South Africa. 
And you made me laugh louder than mother's red lipstick when you told me that the very idea of a vagina, you said cunt, that the very idea of this organ, let alone the sight of it, the smell of it, the taste, the touch of it, disgusted you beyond your lifelong vendetta with broccoli. While an asshole was for you the very center of spiritual clarity, the soul itself in all its giddy up, hallelujah, glory. I remember when you told me of your one and only hetero peccadillo with an old flame of a dad's living in London. She was the first Afrikaner Marxist vegetarian on earth. <laughs> when her father, a cattle farmer, said, if you can't eat my meat, get off my farm, she quit the country. And you, a moist green boy of 23, made love with this horny old bohemian bird of 60 who slept in an Arab tent in her bedroom. And every time she came, reached up to a cord hanging over her bed and rang a Buddhist bell. <laughs> she was also a Buddhist. You must have thought the hetero scenario was kind of psycho. I remember the Reagan Rambo 80s when the new South Africa was being born in blood, mostly black blood, but for a change, some white blood too. And you told me, don't worry, if my face gets bombed through my ear and flies over a roof, hoppity hoppity hop, please no, it's okay. I was happy here. I remember, I remember Jabulani, which means happiness. The guy you fell in love with, a love wider than the sky in your eye. Zulu Afrikaner. Two trains checking into the same station from opposite directions. But to his hetero friends, he was still on their train. The passenger in the closet car was on his side of the color divide. they just as tough on queers as we are. Jabulani, which means happiness. And the feathers of your feelings flew with the blue of a dove on myth-mobile wings outside the train window of the original lovers from Paris, Colette and Gigi, all the way from Paris to Cannes, and there boarded a cloud to Johannesburg to bring you two slap-happy, feather-fluffy, sweet birds of youth, the happiness of Jabulani. Happiness, happiness. Jabulani got sick. You were as dirt scrabble poor as he was, but you could borrow to buy medicine on the black market, check into the hospital when he got going, going, don't go, sick. Where the staff snot-nosed you like you were unmopped puke. You, you homos, you rats, you plague bearers. Jabulani may be dead in the morning, but you can't hold his hand or kiss him, cause you'll get kicked out. Jabulani may be in the morning, but you can't hold his hand or kiss him, cause you're a man, cause you're white, cause He's a man, cause he's black. And that much new South Africa in that hospital there ain't. That much new there ain't. That much new there ain't. That much new. Where are you going to find it? Anywhere. You told me you wanted to throw away all lifestyles and Trojans. Fuck bare back, skin against skin, blood against blood, one with him. Share the plague, symptom for symptom, relapse for relapse, side by side, corpse by corpse, two coffins in the same grave with Jabulani, which means happiness. So you took him home to crawl the last length. Carry his skeleton to the bathroom. Good days when he could eat, bad days when he had no strength. When an inch from here to there got terribly elsewhere. The whisper of small victories and setbacks in the roar of the big despair. How a person goes from a person, I think therefore I am able to go to the bathroom by myself, to a shriveled sack of calcium. How a person goes homeless in their own skin and might manage the vacancy notice of a smile. Two words. Th thank you. Two more. I, I'm scared. Then his parents arrived from afar, as far as any thought of redemption in this world of too many arrows, not enough hearts. Nkosi, we've come to take him home to die. Eagles with ancient eyes, they nested with you on death row for three days of dirge lullabies. You watched as the old grey eagles held up the spotted torso of their son on the bed that used to know only love. 
their hands on him like sacraments, his bone spindly body a Byzantine Christ under the universal glare of a GE bulb, sponging him like you had, washing him for the journey, like washing a new car and smiling at you, even though on their side of the divide, they just as tough on queers as we are. Then Jabulani's mum left for the village to prepare for his home sweet, bitter homecoming. But he passed away the next day in the bed that held love, now death. And you cried in his father's arms, a guitar broken string by string, now broken at the neck. You borrowed more money for the coffin for the long trip back to his home, one white man in a village black with grief. They welcomed you with corn porridge, lamb chops and squash. Together you followed this chanting, wrinkled sagoma. Together you sprinkled the water. Together you packed the stones. And you left thinking, these are my real parents. They showed me more understanding in seven days than my own parents did in a lifetime of chaste communiques. And back in Johannesburg, the days tenderizing your life like a butcher pummeling beef, your heart torn out and stuck back in full of razor blades. One afternoon, Jabulani's young brother showed up from afar, as far as any thought of resurrection in this world of too many pieces and too little glue. Nkosi, my parents sent me to look after you and he stayed with you months cooking and cleaning nursing and nurturing to help you swallow the grief that will always eat you and you knew then they were your parents you'd found a grace beyond the ten commandments a steel hardness of family a blood thickness of community mightier than anything in the so-called first fucking world And now I sit in New York and I think how the headlines tell nobody's story. How we used to sleep in the same bedroom. Now the Atlantic sleeps between us. How you said, I'm careful and candid, but I'm not getting tested. If I knew I had it, I'd be dead in a month. And every place I go, I check the exit sign. Because if it gets you, this dove's got to eagle. This heart, not for breaking, will snap. Brother, brother, sweet, only brother, cry the blue of all the blues for Jabulani. Jabulani, which means happiness. I bag raced whenever I could. To compete, another bag racer and I would find an open area. There, we would put paper bags over our heads, lean toward each other, and set the bags on fire. Then we would turn and run in opposite directions. Whoever got farther before tearing the bag from his head won. Each time I took off, I would see a sheet of flame that quickly became a fire-edged square. Through it, I had a narrow-angle view of ground and sky. Soon, I could smell burnt hair. Usually, by the time I pulled off my bag, the other racer already would have extinguished his headgear. When my scalp began to peel, my parents took me to a doctor who prescribed a sulfur medication for the outside of my entire body. At home, I stood in the bathtub while my father sponged the orange liquid onto my skin, he started at my head and worked down. When he got below my waist, he said, soon you'll have so much hair on your balls, I won't even know you. Then he retreated to his studio, where he had books filled with photographs of beautiful youths. 
My mother collected a sample of my blood and took me to the hospital where she worked. In the laboratory, I saw some organs in jars. One jar held an enlarged heart, another a diminished brain. I also saw an exhibit of objects dug from people's bodies. Among the hooks and splinters was a handgun labeled smuggling attempt. My mother told me I was okay. Then she took a bag of old blood out of a cooler. When we got home, she sprinkled the blood onto plants in the yard. Alone, I conducted a chemistry experiment. I poured alcohol onto a metal table and threw a lit match at the clear puddle. There was a concussion of air as the alcohol ignited. When the fire died down, I was not satisfied, so I found a grocery bag, put it over my head, and lit it. I stood for a moment, looking at the up close sheet of flame. Then I started to run. No one was watching, which was too bad. I spread fire with my head. When my parents came home, my father went to investigate. What happened, my mother asked. He torched his bedroom, my father said. My father called me a fuckster. Then he went into his studio and shut the door. So presumably, he could look privately at his photographs of budding youths. My mother tried to talk to me. All I want is for you to be happy, she said, but I can't tell if you are unless you let me know. It's very simple. You let me know, and then I can tell. So will you let me know? I went to a farm field and screamed obscenities at the grazing cows. They were a good audience. I picked some Queen Anne's lace, rolled it in paper, and smoked it. A fire caught inside my head. Soon I had to fight to make a sound. Later, I looked out a window and saw waves of smoke rising from the field where I had been. A siren went off as the smoke turned from white to yellow to brown. After dark, a glowing red line snaked up the nearest mountain. Thanks. I saw my wife on the street, and a man was hanging on to her. His arms were around her neck, and his legs were bent at the knees so they wouldn't drag on the ground. I went up to her and asked, Who is this man? Oh, I was on a bus, and he put his arms around me, so I let him stay, she said. I woke up one morning and potato chips covered the floor of my apartment. My wife stood in the middle of the room saying, I'm learning to fly. I stood up and discovered that it worked. By avoiding the chips, I was able to fly to the bathroom. I came home and my wife had done the dishes for the first time in six years. I looked at the dishes. They were so clean, they shined. I spent a half hour on each dish, she told me. <laughs> I woke up and my books were scattered all over the house. I was killing cockroaches, my wife said. <laughs> my wife had an abortion and brought back pieces of the fetus. She set them around the apartment, on the table, on window sills, in bureau drawers. Why did you do that, I asked. I want to remember Esther, our dead child, she said. I want to teach you how to jump over a fast moving car. I want to teach you how to get stuck in a window half in and half out. I want to teach you how to scratch my name on the floor with a stick in front of my house. I want to teach you how to smack my face when I'm bad. Oh, there's so much to teach you. I want to teach you how to drink a lot of coffee and not freak out. I want to teach you how to go to Coney Island all by yourself. I want to teach you how to open a door with your stinking feet. I want to teach you how to load a gun with your teeth. Do not panic. I want to teach you how to get a blood stain out of a white rug. Can you turn on a faucet with your ass? Well, I'm going to show you how. 
I want to teach you all about horror and jubilation. I want to teach you all about panic. Do not panic yet. I want to teach you how to sit up straight in a chair. I want to teach you how to stay employed. I want to teach you how to kill your employer. I want to teach you that a worker shall not have a better car than the employer. Look at me when I'm teaching you. I want to teach you all about holiday rituals. I want to teach you how to open a gift with a look of surprise on your face. I want to teach you how to bob for fruit in a bucket of honey. I want to teach you all about what the fuck's wrong with you. Get ready to learn. We're lying around, it's Saturday afternoon. You're looking at me, I'm looking at you. We're waiting for the cat food to come. Waiting for the cat food to come. The cat food's supposed to come between 12 and 2. And now it's noon and we have to decide what to do. Should we have sex or wait for the cat food? What if it comes before we do? Waiting for the cat food to come. Waiting for the cat food to come. Each time you put your hand on my thigh, or I put my thigh on your hand, we have to try to understand if we're about to hear the cat food man carrying the cat food cans. Now we're lying on the bed. We've had sex and it's still not two. I've come and you've come too. But where's the cat food? Where's the cat food? Waiting for the cat food to come. 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 You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.